It's the Movie Nerd Super Bowl. The sight and sound poll is out for 2022, and I've got my thoughts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Merle here with my thoughts on the 2022 sight and sound poll. And if you're like most people in the world, you're probably saying, what the hell is the sight and sound poll? Well, as I mentioned, it's sort of like the movie nerd Super Bowl, a solar eclipse for film Twitter, if you will. Every 10 years, a poll is conducted by the magazine Sight and Sound, which is a product of the British Film Institute, or BFI. The first sight and sound poll was conducted in 1952 when 85 critics were asked to participate and 63 responded to the poll. Most of those critics, by the way, said it was a terrible idea. The winner was Italian director Vittorio De Sica's Bicycle Thieves, with Charles Charlie Chaplin, City Lights, and The Gold Rush both tying for second place. From 1962 to 2002, Citizen Kane was voted the greatest film of all time. In 2012, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo took the number one spot. And in this year's poll, Jean Dielman, 23, Quad du Commerce, 1080 Brussels was voted number one. Much more on that later. One important thing to note about the Sight and Sound poll is that when it goes out to critics and asks them to submit their top 10 films, it does not ask them to rank those choices. So the rankings that are generated for the Sight and Sound poll are based on how many times a film appears on a ballot from a critic or a director. In 2002, for example, Citizen Kane appeared on 46 ballots, while Vertigo appeared on 41 ballots, which meant that Citizen Kane stayed as the greatest movie of all time. The fact that these aren't ranked choices is something that's been brought up over the years, and particularly this year, as a potential flaw in the system, largely because we saw a huge sea change in the results over the last 10 years. One thing that some people would probably ask is, why does any of this matter? And let's get this out of the way. The idea of a list of greatest films is a little bit silly because you're never going to come up with an objective list of anything when it comes to art. But one reason that the Sight and Sound poll is given a little extra weight is because it is only done every 10 years and it is used as a tool, at least academically, to help determine what the canon is. The canon being the films that matter the most. Sight and Sound was a big reason why Citizen Kane was considered the best movie ever made for so long after an initial release that pretty much only won critical acclaim. Its pool of international critics, which has widened to academics and other film experts over the years, generates what's largely considered the most prestigious of all film rankings. And it's that prestige that vaulted the poll to the top of movie news headlines last week when this list was released. So what happened this year in particular with the 2022 Sight and Sound poll that really got people talking more than usual? Well, one thing was that they changed the methodology of the poll compared to the last poll that was done 10 years ago. Sight and Sound set a stage for big changes when it nearly doubled the number of people polled from 846 last time to 1,639, by far the largest number of lists ever solicited. And not just from critics, but also programmers, curators, film archivists, and and academics. And the big headline for this poll was the continued meteoric rise of director Chantal Ackerman's Gene Dealman. It was a relatively obscure film until fairly recently, which debuted on the Sight and Sound poll in 2012, ranked number 35. And while a lot of people had projected that it could potentially enter the top 10, few thought that it would actually be number one. But when all of the results were tabulated, Gene Dealman was listed on the largest number of ballots submitted and thus took the top spot. Gene Dealman's rise was the biggest sign of an overall trend for this list, which saw more films from women directors than at any other point in in the poll's history, either rising up the ranks or added to the list for the first time. For example, Claire Denis' film, Beau Travail, which debuted in 2012, tied for 78th, jumped all the way to number 7 on the 2022 list. The full top 10 consisted of Jean Dielman at number 1, previous number 1 Vertigo at number 2, Citizen Kane at number 3, Yasujiro Ozu's Tokyo Story at number 4, Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love at number 5, 2001 A Space Odyssey at number 6, Beau Travail at number 7, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive at number 8, the 1929 Soviet experimental documentary Man with a Movie Camera at number 9, and Gene Kelly and Stanley Donen's Singing in the Rain at number 10. Dropping out of the top 10 were Jean Renoir's The Rules of the Game, down from number 4 to number 13, F.W. Murnau's silent classic Sunrise, down from number 5 to number 33, John Ford's The Searchers, down from number 7 to number 15, Carl Theodore Dreyer's The Passion of Joan of Arc, down from number 9 to a tie for 21st, 
and Fellini's 8.5 down from number 10 to a tie for 31st. In addition to the big jumps from Gene Dealman and Beau Travail, another Chantal Ackerman film, News From Home, entered the list, as well as Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust, Usman Simbin's Black Girl, and Agnes Varda's The Gleaners and I, all making the list for the first time. In all, 11 films from female directors made the Sight & Sound Top 100, up from just two films 10 years ago. Other new additions to the critics list included Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing at number 24, Barry Jenkins' Moonlight tied for 60th, Hayao Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro and Spirited Away at number 75 and 72 respectively, Bong Joon-ho's Parasite tied for 90th, and Jordan Peele's Get Out tied for 95th. Films that fell off the list included Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull, Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, David Lean's Lawrence of Arabia, Robert Altman's Nashville, Jean Renoir's Grand Illusion, and due to a rule change that no longer allowed it to be listed alongside the first film, The Godfather Part Two, which had been listed at number 31 in 2012, but fell off the list altogether in 2022. So what's behind all of these changes? Other than the fact that the canon obviously does change from decade to decade and always has when it comes to the sight and sound poll. Well, one thing, and this is not a supposition, is that the BFI was looking to diversify the list and shake up the film canon tree a little bit. And that's not a guess on my part. That was a stated goal from the organization itself. In the write-up that accompanied the release of the list, the British Film Institute's Jason Wood said, quote, as well as being a compelling list, one of the most important elements is that it shakes a fist at the established order. Canon should be challenged and interrogated and as part of the BFI's remit to not only revisit film history but to also reframe it, it's so satisfying to see a list that feels quite radical in its sense of diversity and inclusion. But this desire to shake up the film canon is nothing new. As a matter of fact, Sight & Sound has been looking to shake things up for decades and defy what they have often referred to as the film orthodoxy. In the introduction to 1962's poll, the magazine Second, Sight & Sound stated, We asked people to send us really personal selections not to let themselves be influenced by academic orthodoxy into nominating films they might not have seen for 20 or 30 years and remembered as misty landmarks. So all the way back in the 60s, Sight & Sound was already saying, don't include the films that you think you should include, include the films that you want to include. In the ramp up to 1972's poll, they stated the 1972 list is weighted more heavily than might have been expected, no less solidly than the 1962 list, towards orthodoxy. So again, you see here in the third poll, a growing frustration from BFI and Sight and & Sound that the same movies kept popping up. In the introduction to 1982's poll, a clearly frustrated publication wrote, the range of titles that turn up in individual lists is probably greater than ever, but when the votes are totted up, it appears that astonishingly little has changed, a conclusion likely to depress some as much as it may reassure others. So again, you saw here a desire and really a request from Sight & Sound to add new movies to the canon. There were new movies in the list overall, but they weren't quite happy with that top 10. It still was a little stale for them. In the intro to 1992's list, as Citizen Kane continued its dominance at the top spot, Sight & Sound first referenced the absence of women directors in the poll. They said, quote, it is remarkable that Citizen Kane, which has topped the list in the last three Sight & Sound polls, should reign supreme for both critics and filmmakers it may well be that certain films matter to a generation. The appearance of Chantal Ackerman's Gene Dealman on some lists seems to be one such example. With the exceptions of Ackerman, Maya Durin, Jane Campion, and a few others, women directors are noticeable by their absence. 1992, by the way, was the first year that Sight & Sound conducted a director's poll, but it's interesting that as far back as 30 years ago, Sight & Sound was already specifically citing Gene Dealman as a substantial work from a female director. The the introduction to the 2002 Sight & Sound poll attempted to take the focus off of the top films entirely, saying, quote, The immediate lesson of the 2002 poll, perhaps the last of the film strip era, is surely that diversity has to be defended. Cinemas, video shops, libraries, syllabuses, and governments all need to be challenged to keep open those channels that connect the world. And as for lists, let's have more of them and more iconoclastic ones, but instead of celebrating the winners, remember it's the margins that really matter. Matter. The most interesting note for me there is, again, as the top films were largely unchanged from decade to decade, the publication began to tell people to kind of focus, well, don't pay attention to those. Look at all the other new titles on the list. Again, a desire on their part to look at the change that was coming, and a change that was obviously very slow for them. 
In 2012, after a big expansion in the voting pool that saw Vertigo take the number one spot, but did feel much the same as previous years, particularly in the top 10, Sight & Sound wrote, quote, What the increase in numbers has and hasn't done is surprising. We have a new number one, a color film, but the overall top 10 has shifted back in time with fully three silent films and nothing more recent than 1968's 2001. Female filmmakers also continue to be underserved by the consensus. While a quarter of our voters were women, there were barely nine female directed titles in our top 250. So again, back in 2012, you can see a big push from Sight & Sound and BFI to diversify the voting pool, but the results again were not exactly what they were hoping for. They were falling into what they called that film orthodoxy. That led the magazine, as I mentioned previously, to more than double the number of ballots that they solicited for the 2022 poll, and the results were finally closer to what they had been hoping to get for decades. Regarding their new pool of voters, Sight & Sound wrote last week, quote, this year's poll reached a wider and more diverse group than ever before and incorporates the top 10 list of over 1,600 participants from all corners of the globe who voted for more than 4,000 films overall. This compares to the 846 who were asked 10 years ago and reflects a variety of factors, including the more diverse group of contributors voting in the poll and the impact and increased influence of film commentators internationally via the internet. This seemed like a doubling down of the strategy that didn't work like Sight & Sound had hoped it would back in 2012. By doubling the number of voters, you open up the possibility that you do have, as they said, radical change in the canon and the top 10 and that's exactly what was delivered now i don't know the mindset of the people who voted in these polls why they chose the films that they chose but i'm noting these changes because of the big sea change that we saw in just 10 years which has been unlike any change that we've ever seen in the sight and sound poll before i think that it does reflect a desire institutionally to change things up which led them to make even more changes in who voted in the poll to help to construct the result that they were looking for. And I think it's really interesting to compare the results in the critics poll to the results in the director's poll, which is run parallel. 358 directors participated in 2012's poll, while 480 cast ballots in 2022. Still an expansion, but a smaller one, both in sheer numbers and percentage than we saw in the critics poll. In all, directors dropped 32.7% of their selections from 2012, while critics only dropped 25.7%. Of the new films added, 73.5% of those on the director's list came from non-white, non-male directors, while 80% of new entries on the critics' list met those criteria. So this is already an interesting thing to note, which is that directors dropped more films out of their top 100 by percentage than the critics did, but the movies that were added, the new movies on the list, were slightly less diverse as defined by the BFI than the ones that were on the critics list. But there were some big movements in common with both polls. For the directors, Gene Dealman went from unranked at all in 2012 to number four. Bo Travail went from unranked at all to number 14, and Do the Right Thing went from unranked to number 29. There were also a few films in common that were dropped from both lists, including Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, Werner Herzog's Aguirre, The Wrath of God, and the surrealist film Unchian Andalou. So looking at the two lists, you see a very similar movement, but I think you see with critics more of a willingness to push films from female directors higher up on the list than they were before and to add more films from that non-white, non-male perspective onto the list than directors. It's only slightly more, but I think it matters when you're looking at the overall picture. Let's talk about the new number one, though, the film that critics have appointed as the greatest movie ever made, which is Gene Dealman. This was a remarkable turn of events for the Sight and Sound poll. I mean, you look at Gene Dealman in particular, not just because of how far it climbed up the list. Bo Travail actually climbed much further from where it was in the 2012 poll to its finish in the top 10, but also because of the type of movie that Gene Dealman is. It is a three hour and 15 minute long experimental movie that's devoid of score, shot mostly with a locked off camera. It consists largely of watching a woman named Gene Dealman perform chores around her apartment. There are occasional trips outside, but those also involve everyday tasks, waiting in line at the bank, going to the butcher, trying to replace a button. Dialogue is sparse and minimal. Shots last for minutes at a time. The film ends with a six-minute uncut shot of our lead character sitting silently in a room. 
In many ways, Gene Dealman is the antithesis of what we've been told a movie is as far as artifice. Its rise in the critical estimation is really credited to an increased availability due to a remaster that was done in the last decade and its availability on things like the Criterion streaming service. It's also available on HBO Max. Streaming really has helped the penetration as far as classic films, international cinema, and that's one of the things that I think is objectively great about the streaming movement amongst a sea of negatives. I wasn't overly familiar with Gene Dealman before the Sight and Sound poll was released. I'd heard the name mentioned before in other lists of, you know, the great films, especially in the last 10 years or so. And when I made the decision to do this video, the first thing I did was I sat down and watched it because I wanted to talk about this movie, not in a theoretical sense, but in an analytical sense as somebody who had actually seen it. And I've got to say, I can see why this movie is revered. I can see how it is influential. And I don't think it's a bad film by any measure. It is meticulously crafted and one of the most unique films I've ever seen. But I doubt that I'll ever watch it again. It's not a film I would say that I enjoyed as much as I experienced. And that is a big turn on for a lot of people, but to me, that doesn't make it one of the greatest films ever made. It makes it an interesting film. It makes it a film that is worthy of interest, but not one of the greatest. That's just one guy's opinion though. And that's the whole point of this exercise. I will say that it is by far the least accessible movie that's ever been number one on the sight and sound poll of Bicycle Thieves, Citizen Kane, and Vertigo. I think a significant number of even the biggest cinephiles may find it difficult to sit through Gene Dealman and people that might be driven to the movie because of its number one ranking that don't know a lot about it. I think a healthy number of them would probably turn it off halfway through and maybe write off the whole sight and sound list as critical ego stroking. Now, if the goal was to shake up the canon, then that mission was accomplished and then some. Previous lists, I believe, had the goal of finding out what critics and the people polled thought were the greatest films of all time, whereas I think this poll had the goal of finding out what the critics and the people polled thought were the greatest films of this time. It's a subtle difference, but I think it's enough to change how this list may be viewed historically against the others. And whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is up for debate. It's undeniable that every previous list in the Sight and Sound poll was very white and very male. And by the way, this one is too, but there are big steps toward recognizing filmmakers that are outside of the established norms. And I think that that is unequivocally a good thing. But I think that the gradual change to the canon that we saw in previous previous polls has given way again to what BFI sought, which was a radical reformation of the canon, a slight or maybe not so slight overcorrection to the wrongs from the past. And my worry as we go forward to the 2032 sight and sound list is, will there be a correction the other way? And will the legacies of films like Gene Dealman be affected? What if in 2032, Gene Dealman falls from number one to number 11 or number 12? Will people then look at that movie as having not deserved the top spot? The results are being hailed by BFI now, but could this backfire a decade from now, or will there be a movement in the next 10 or 20 years to include Gene Dealman out of obligation because you want to avoid that kind of overcorrection? And then does that change the results as far as what people really want to include on their list or if they feel obligated to include something? And again, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that Gene Dealman was included on the most number of ballots this year out of obligation. I think that it was included because there was this desire to shake up the film canon. There was this desire to to elevate films that were directed by women because they have been ignored in previous polls. I think that that's great. But again, where does this shake out 10 years from now? And what does it mean as far as the selections this year? And alongside these adjustments to the list and also the rise of social media, there was something else that I can categorically denounce. And that was the judgment that was visited on some people, especially publicly, for lists that weren't deemed reflective enough of the necessary changes or just not interesting enough. Each year, Sight & Sound publishes the full list that were submitted by the pool of directors and critics who participated. And while that full listing isn't yet available, there were some that were published alongside the poll. And one of those lists was the director, Ty West. He's an established director who released two films this year that I really enjoyed, X and Pearl. Pearl in particular, I think, had one of the best performances of the year from Mia Goth. But his choices were roundly criticized once they were released for being boring, for only including American, 
American films for lacking a film that was directed by a woman and basically just kind of criticized as being a basic listing of what they deemed he thought the classics of American films should be. The films on West's top 10 were Citizen Kane, The Godfather, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Apocalypse Now, Psycho, Sunset Boulevard, Chinatown, Jaws, Taxi Driver, and Easy Rider. Now, nearly all of those films are currently on or have appeared on the Sight and Sound poll in the past, some of them at or near the top. But the criticism for Ty West picking those films was incredibly harsh. I defended those picks on social media, and just in my replies, I saw him accused of being intellectually uncurious, xenophobic, disinterested in films made by women, ignorant of cinema after post-1979, boring, and generally at fault for not picking more interesting movies. All with no context provided by Ty West as to why he picked those films, or why they were so meaningful to him, why they were his personal top 10. The reaction to his picks was actually harsh enough that if I were a director or a critic asked to submit a poll for 2032, then I would sit there and actually maybe overanalyze my picks. What if my own top 10 films are deemed too boring? Do I need to include lists that conform to the idea of what others think the list should look like? Or should I pick the top 10 films that I want to pick even if it doesn't conform? to what people think I should pick. If I'm a director, should I pick a film that people think that I should pick based on my work, or should I pick the film that's most personally meaningful to me? It's a tough choice. Which really brings us back to the concept of orthodoxy, which is something that the BFI has fought against for so many decades. Orthodoxy is basically the idea of picking the films that you think you should pick versus the films that you want to pick. But if the aim of Sight and Sound is to shake your fist at at the film canon to shake up what has been considered the orthodoxy, then doesn't submitting a list that perhaps more closely reflects the past become unorthodox, and doesn't submitting a list that shakes things up become the orthodox, become what's expected? It's a heady question, but it really breaks down to, should sight and sound be openly encouraging shaking your fist at the orthodoxy, or should they be doing what they've always done, which is to encourage their participants to include the 10 films that they personally believe? are the 10 greatest films in the history of cinema, and then letting those results shake out in the final poll. I also think that singling Ty West out for his picks is really unfair on the part of the public, not on sight and sound. They didn't do this at all because there are other directors that picked films with far weirder criteria. Wes Anderson, for example, picked 10 French films because as he said, he was in France when he made the list. Why is he not being criticized for not taking the assignment seriously? John Carpenter's list of top 10 films hasn't changed in decades. Martin Scorsese's top 10 list doesn't include anything that would be considered quote unquote modern cinema, and yet I don't see the criticism for their lists. As films become more available, I also think that there is a sense of elitism that has settled into a lot of the cinephile community, and particularly online, where the idea that if your tastes conform to what is considered classic cinema, then you just don't understand, you're not going deep enough into what movies really are, and it becomes almost a competition to who can name the most obscure film as one of their influences. This is counter, in my opinion, to the concept of art itself. The only relationship that matters in art is the relationship between that art and the viewer. The relationship between you and a piece of art can only be defined by you. That's why I say, even though I am a movie critic, it is not my job to tell you what you should think about a movie. It is my job to tell you what I think about a movie, and then you can go see it and make your own determination and decide do you agree with me or do you not agree with me. So this idea that you should be able to dictate somebody's personal tastes about movies is really just kind of offensive to me. Take director S.S. Rajamuli, whose RRR has become a global sensation in 2022. His sight and sound top 10 list included Forrest Gump, Kung Fu Panda, Disney's Aladdin and The Lion King, and two films from Mel Gibson, Braveheart and Apocalypto. But I saw little to no criticism of his list. As a matter of fact, I saw the opposite. I saw people that were praising him for picking unique and unexpected choices as opposed to Ty West's choices that really didn't have any influence on his filmmaking. And my question is, well, how the hell do you know that? If you were watching X and you don't see the influence of a movie like Psycho on that movie, then you're not really paying attention. It did occur to me, however, as I was prepping this video, that for me to go on this long screed about objectivity and talking about other people's top 10 lists, 
first, it might be a little bit hypocritical for me not to put a little skin in the game and provide my own. This is a list of the 10 movies that I would submit to Sight & Sound based on the movies that I have seen and based on the movies that I personally feel are the greatest 10 movies of all time. The 10 movies that show the potential of what movies can be. And those movies are in alphabetical order, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Casablanca, The Godfather, Lawrence of Arabia, Mad Max Fury Road, Disney's 1940 animated Pinocchio, Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window, Akira Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, Singing in the Rain, and Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood. Now, as you can see, my list would be open to a lot of the same criticisms as Ty West's list, but it also doesn't include, for example, my personal favorite movie of all time, Jaws. 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 Not on that list. Not because that movie doesn't mean anything to me. Not because it wasn't massively influential, but because the context of this list and the context of my own personal tastes, in my mind, are completely different. That's how difficult this task can be. And honestly, if you ask me again tomorrow, I can give you 10 completely different movies that I would be just as confident in submitting to Sight and Sound. The point of this whole long rant is that any list is inherently subjective. And the idea of looking at one person's list and saying, well, this is obviously not representational of your entire life and career as a maker of film or a lover of film is beyond silly. It's beyond stupid. The Sight and Sound poll is notable because it is a one of a kind collection of the consensus between a huge pool and an ever growing pool of contributors. And that consensus is what I think we should look at. To single out these people one by one is certainly something that is of interest, but I don't think it's something that should become the focus of the discussion itself. My advice for Sight and Sound in 2032 when they are prepping their next decade poll, and of course they're going to take this advice because I'm sure they love to hear what I have to think, would be to in some ways continue to do exactly what they are doing. Sight and Sound should continue to grow their pool of contributors. That pool should be inclusive of countries around the world, people of all races, people of all genders, people of all backgrounds. And the results of the Sight and Sound poll should reflect as many varying viewpoints as possible. But the one thing that I would advise them not to do is to not openly advocate for its poll participants to shake their fist at the cannon or shake up the establishment. Let the poll speak for itself. And if you're doing your job in recruiting people from varying viewpoints, then I think you're going to get a valid result that represents all of those viewpoints. I think that Sight and Sound really encouraged a movement on this poll that skewed the results slightly. I think that Gene Dielman probably still would have been a top 10 film. I think that Bo Chevelle still would have been on there. I think that we still would have seen movies from more female directors. I think we still would have seen movies from more directors of color on this list, but I think that they were advanced up the list slightly because it was an open desire to shake things up in a big way. I would stick with the original mission statement and ask the participants to do what they originally asked them to do, the 10 films that most impacted you, the 10 films that you think are the greatest, and then if the results are exactly what we got this year, then that's great. Then the results of the poll are free from any kind of accusation that the institution in any way tampered with the result or encouraged a result that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise. There is one other small rule change that I would institute if I were in charge, which I never will be, that would also make the list seem a little less ephemeral, and that would be a rule that would disqualify films that were five years old or younger. That would really only affect three movies that appeared on the poll this year, Get Out, Parasite, and Portrait of a Lady on Fire. By the way, I think that all three of those films are utterly brilliant, and I would never say that they don't belong on the sight and sound list, but I think what it does do is to allow them to appear on the poll in 2032 and for their appearance to not seem like it is part of the current trend, but to recognize their rightful place, I believe, as really, really transcendent works of filmmaking. These polls don't really settle anything anyway, and the average person on the street has seen maybe one movie in the Sight and Sound top 10 poll, maybe none. But I also think that it does hold an important spot as far as the critical consensus, because you do have this discussion on kind of an academic level and the director's poll on an artistic level about what everybody is thinking. The Sight and Sound list will always be up for debate, but I think it remains as close as we have to a living historical document of critical consensus over the decades. And I think that its aim should be very simple. Find the best people that you can possibly find to weigh in on the topic, ask their opinion, and then let the votes 
tell the story. So those are my thoughts on the sight and sound poll. Very long-winded thoughts. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. And also go check out the sight and sound poll because regardless of the ranking, etc., there are some great movies on that list and movies that are worthy of seeing if you haven't seen them yet. Thanks so much for watching. Of course, I'll be back here later this week and next week and into the new year with more box office, movie reviews, movie news, everything that can cover the world of entertainment and just things that I want to talk about for the three of you that have stuck around this long to hear me talk about sight and sound. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.